I'm so excited to be here today on this exquisite pink beach in the most just idyllic surroundings you can imagine. Tropical paradise, coral seas, pristine oceans, blue skies, and it's just amazing. And here with John Higson, <laughs> who, you know, originally from, from Britain, um, it's got a, an amazing history in, in Sweden that we're going to hear about. And now here on Tanjung Ringit. Ringit. Tanjung Ringit. Tanjung Ringit. Tanjung Ringit. Ringit. Right, yeah. got to get that pronunciation. Yeah. Tanjung Ringit. With an extraordinary project, which is really Eco Regions Indonesia. John, it's such a, such a pleasure to be here, such an honour. And I'm so glad we could take the time to, to come out here and, and, you know, really get an experience of this and also to meet with you and hear your story and find out what this is really all about because this is, you know, one of the most extraordinary projects that I've been able to come across and, and what you're doing is, is huge and, and really significant. So thanks so much for taking the time and glad we can be here. Yeah, glad to have you here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So what I'd love to hear, I mean, we're going to cover a bunch of stuff and I really want to hear a little bit of your story and your background because that mm. is absolutely fascinating and how mm. you came to be, you know, here in this part of the world doing this kind of work. Mm. Definitely want to hear a little bit about the, um, you know, what's actually going on here, what the project is sure. and, and, and the, mm. the nature of that, but also the heart of that and where that mm. came from. Mm. Um, we're going to look at some of the biggest challenges facing humanity and how mm. this really answers those and yeah. then what anybody can do. Mm. And I really want to hear because I'm fascinated, there's lots of so many layers to this project you know mm. I'm kind of looking at it wrapping my head around it for the last few days and the last mm. few weeks and talking to different people and there seems to be so much opportunity for different people to be getting involved at different levels yeah. um, and there's there's such a such a variety there so I definitely mm. want so that's probably the the outline for what I want to hear mm. but can we start with a little bit about just an overview of what's actually happening here what is the what is the eco regions and what what's this all about and then I'll hear a bit about you and sure um, well I mean how this really started, I mean, I think you have to go back a little bit to, to, to say what it's really about. But sure. we, we've done a load of uh, sustainable projects uh, in different places. And we've traveled around the world looking at some of the world's, you know, we've seen fantastic, you know, products, projects, people, places. They're all doing fantastically, fantastic sustainable things. Mm. But they're all fragmented. They're all mm. split up. So this project is really a realization of all of them need a, a home base, they need a place that they can gather, that we can gather all these amazing people and places into one large area with a whole group of sustainable laws. Yeah, and nice. so we're creating and holding that space. We're doing development ourselves, but it's also an invitation uh, to all the people to come here and realize uh, mm. their green dreams. And it's on a whole range of different levels. And also it necessitates having a large area as well. Yeah, because sure. the, the environment it doesn't pay attention to small, you know. If you put up a, a little eco resort, if your neighbour's pumping their sewage out or, or cutting the forest down, it becomes a nonsense. Yeah. So you need these large tracts of land and you need all different players because mm. essentially what we're creating is a, is a little micro green country or economy, if you wow. like. Yeah. And then inviting all the different actors to come in. It's local people, it's the national government, it's uh, entrepreneurs, it's NGOs that whole mix mm. and it's landing them in a place where you've got sustainable regulation in place mm. and where you're working together uh, with the people of the country as well wow. to preserve those natural assets and but also to build an economy around it mm. you know you need economies of scale mm. and the most fascinating thing with the whole thing is when you land that huge group of different people onto that platform what happens what's that cross fertilization mm. it becomes something that we'll never be able to imagine at the start point here yeah. But how we started is we place a few really powerful, uh, competent, green partners onto that platform yep. and then invite other people to gather around them. Wow. So tell me about the land here, the, the size and, the, and, the, and the, the diversity and, you know, mm -hmm. kind of what, I mean, what I'm looking at. It's, it's just exquisite. Well, look, and then this is uh, about 350 hectares, so it's 10 wow. bays and beaches. And it's, it's a beautiful limestone peninsula coming out into the water right at the end of Lombok. Mm -hmm. On one side, it's, you've got this pristine bay with hardly any wave action at all. Yeah. We're sitting on a pink beach. All the other ones are white sand beaches. On the other side, you've got limestone cliffs. We should look at those in a minute. 30 to 60 meters high with big rollers coming in. Wow. Around the area, you've got some top surf spots, just 10, 15 minutes by boat from here. Uh -huh. Great coral and surfing. So you've got this area which is perfect for development. Yeah. Uh, for a sustainable development. And then attached to it, there's a 1,000 hectare area 
which is called Hacker M. It's like a social forestry area that we've helped to set up. Mm -hmm. And in that, we're basically helping the local people do organic permaculture farming, oh, wow. you know, rain capture techniques, all these different things. So working together with them and then of course inviting them into the area to set up joint venture businesses as well. Wow. On this particular beach, we'll be setting up a fish restaurant with a local fishing village. That's the idea actually came from the ladies in the village. Okay. And uh, so the restaurant's going to be called the Ladies of Telona, and it's going to be here on Pink Beach. Wow. Uh, so it's, Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. And I got to enjoy dinner last right. night from yeah. the Ladies of Telona. And yeah. oh my God, I mean, we've been living here in this, well, not, not here, but in mm. Bali, just, you know, around here in mm. this uh, part of the world. Mm. Uh, three years, and I've enjoyed some amazing meals. But I'll tell you what, last night mm. <laughs> yeah. was something, something special. And day fresh really catch was. from the yeah. husbands. Yeah. Perfect. So that's, um, we got on to Ladies of Telona. Let's, let's have a look more of those. So what's, what's, the, um, what's the economic climate here, you know, the locals and the, and the economy, and what's, what's happening here, and what's, what do you foresee for that? So you look at you know, the Ladies of Telona, for example, mm. we're going to be able to have a restaurant here. What's the, what's the impact of, of what you're doing? Well, th this on is that? one of the, I mean, there's been a lot of studies done on, on this area and, and the other area as well that we're doing uh, um, development in. And they're some of the areas which are the most uh, socially, environmentally, and uh, economically challenged or mm. vulnerable. Um, so these areas have had uh, a lot of poverty uh, yeah. for, for a long period of time. So the impact will, will be quite immense. When we come into an area like this, we, we always start off the whole process with community planning. So we go in with the local people and the local okay. government, and we sit down and do the whole master planning together with them. And then we also, um, during this process we look at all the problems and then we look at all the dreams and all the solutions as well okay so we invite the locals to come up with ideas of their their ideas for businesses their ideas for business wow. developments so there's a variety of joint venture businesses going to be set up uh, yeah. together with the local people so the boost so so we'll be offering employment for people mm -hmm. who want to work in the different things that we're going to be working with but they also get the opportunity to come in and set up their own businesses mm. and to be front of stage you know not, yeah, wow. not backstage as well because yeah. it's one of the huge challenges when developers come to an area mm. right and they look at this pristine you know and they're thinking wow we could carve down all this mm. we could build villas there we can get the local people mm. and they can do their job and do cleaning and you know whatever mm. and you know they kind of in a lot of ways we see development not only wrecking the, the local environment mm. but wrecking the local society and culture and the mm. you know that that fabric of so how does, you know, you mentioned community planning, how's that going to um, you know, just honour the local culture and the local people and, and, and how that, <laughs> tell me more about that. But, but it's, all about, it's, it's all about doing that really. I mean, if you're looking at it purely economically, it yeah. makes sense because you create something that's unique. Mm. Otherwise you can pick up McDonald's or whatever and you can just stick it down, you can have a sure. concept and, it's, and it, it could be anywhere. Yeah. But what is unique in a place is a geography and it's people, mm. you know, and it's, you know, it's, it's environment. Mm. So we're preserving the environment by putting in sustainable laws, but also we're bringing forward, you know, inviting the culture, uh, the local people to step into that space mm. and do the things that they feel passionate about. Wow. We're talking to some of the fishermen, you know, there was a guy who's been fishing for ages and he says, you know, all this sounds wonderful, but I don't want to work in a restaurant. I'm, so, so I'm a fisherman. I just want to make more money fishing. Yeah. If I can sell directly to you and the ladies in this village have got a restaurant and it's benefiting a whole of our community, that's absolutely great. Yeah, so they get to wow. choose their own areas. Uh, yeah. One of the other ideas that came out here, the, the local people down here are Sussex, so, and they're proud of their architecture. Mm -hmm. So they said, we want to set up a, a tourist village, but we, we don't know how to, to build uh, you know, modern, sustainable, and up to tourist standard, mm. but we can do Sussex houses. Yeah. So we want to set up a Sasak village in cooperation with you, which is environmentally top, and it's a top tourist uh, site. So we, we design it together, and we're like, oh, wow. fine. So that's Perfect. going to be behind the ladies of Tilona. Wow. <laughs> also on, on Pink Beach wow, as well. Sasak village. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, so it's them choosing what they're going to do. Sometimes in some projects you get an idea, we're going to re-educate the local population to do this and this. Mm. And well, that's, often, the, that's the common thought. We're going to come in, we're going to educate them, we're going to train them, we're going to... They, but they're, they're sitting with massive local knowledge. Yeah. There's nobody with better knowledge of fisheries around here. Of course. But, you know, and, and they're forced quite often into overfishing because they've got a whole load of middlemen yeah. who are price pressuring them, so they've got to fish more and more. Mm. But if they don't have to fish more and more, if they're vertically integrating, mm. and so they're involved in the restaurant, they're involved in all of those kind of stuff, 
then that's the perfect thing. Yeah. And, and the ladies, they, I mean, last night, they can cook the most amazing food, but, sure. but they've never run a restaurant. Yeah. So we bring in somebody. So that becomes the partnership. Mm. Who's got what skill set? Mm. Locals, if you're doing local development, who's, locals are experts. This is their place. Yeah. They, so in this particular area, we're in these 350 hectares. There's, there's nobody actually living in this area. This is the end of the peninsula. Right. But around it, you've got seven villages okay. and about 4,500 people. So what we do is we create a village cooperation with mm -hmm. all of them. And whenever we're doing a job, we select equally, or we get the village to select equal amounts uh, from e each of these seven villages. Mm -hmm. and so they become, and they suggest their own projects and wow. we put them together. And we have a good discussion. Is it going to be viable? Is it not going to be viable? So it's got yep. to be an economy in the yeah, whole thing. Sure. Otherwise it's not economic. How are we going to market it? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's so true when you, um, you know, when you go to a place, as a traveller, mm. what you want to experience is the local culture and the local people and the local food and the local environment. Mm. And what we lose when we, when we create these developments is, oh, we've got another beautiful, pristine location mm. and I'm sitting in a hotel or a villa or a, we've got no connection to, mm. you know, the actual, we might meet some local people, but not that, that culture. Exactly. And what you're doing here is going, how do, we, how do we, you know, preserve that culture, but bring that, really bring that to the heart of, of what we're creating here, mm. rather than kind of pushing it to the side and doing, oh, we know how to do this. Mm. And it becomes a little show that goes on on yeah. Thursday evenings or Wednesday We're going to do the yeah. local dance something, something. No. And another big part of sustainable development as well is that, you know, when you come in here, if, if you're investing, staying here, working here, or just visiting the place, you want to be in an area that's got, you know, where the local people are, you know, they're feeling good. Yeah. They're involved, you know, yeah. they're in charge of their own destiny yeah. very much as well. And, and that's also a big part of sustainable development. Mm. It's not just the, the technical side of, you know, taking care of the environment and planting more trees and stuff. Sure. That is also a, a big part of... And uh, I can really feel, you know, in our other conversations as well, really feel your heart for these people yeah. and, the, you know, really wanting to, to preserve that and, and honour that. Yeah. That's kind of the whole sociology side, which is really so important. Mm. And I, you know, it just filled my heart with joy to hear you, to hear you speaking about that. Um, but now you just mentioned the, the technical side of you know, environmental sustainability. Let's have a look at that too, because you've talked about um, you know, regulations and laws and, and whatever, mm. and usually they're not, that's not kind of terminology that, that a developer would use, for example. They come in and they say, well, what are the, what are the regulations? And mm. then how can we you know, maximise our profit inside of that and kind mm. of push the boundaries and do what we can do? Mm. But you've got to take in a very different approach. You're working with the government and you're you know, kind of setting the stage here for, for developers and builders to come and do mm. stuff. So how's, what's the, what's the relationship there? What's going on? Well, I mean, it, again, if you look just at the economics of the situation, some of the most high value property areas in the world are places where there's been a natural development towards sustainable regulation and, and a huge mix of, 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 of green projects going on. You can look at uh, Seattle, parts of California, different places in the world. You know. mm -hmm. And what basically happened in those places was years and years ago, a gang of hippies or environmentalists turned up and they saw it was really beautiful and they started doing some really cool things, preserving the natural assets and the beauty of the place. Mm -hmm. Then you'll get some businesses, other people move in, then a big business moves in, then it becomes quite large, it's attracting a lot more people and then right at the end what happens is the government comes in or they organise themselves and stop making sustainable rules and regulations. To, to protect what it is that's grown up naturally yeah, organically. Sure. And this yep. happens like over 15 to 25 years usually. Okay. But we don't have time for that anymore. Right. You know? And we need to be able to fast track these things. Okay. So what in essence we've done is taken this whole concept, turned it on its head. We start with the regulations. Wow. We bring in the good players. We involve in the local communities and then all these other businesses and people. Then the people turn up. can come. And so we take it from 15 to 20 years into like three to four, five years. Wow. So it's fast-tracking that sustainability by putting in those rules and regulations first. Because mm. without these natural assets, I mean, if you were going to set up a, you know, the Ladies of Tolona restaurant or whatever it is that, that, that comes here, it's the reef outside. It's the yeah. red coral that makes yeah. the sand on the pink beach. You know, this. And, and so it's preserving these natural assets. Mm. In lots of the different you know, developments that have been done, particularly in Indonesia, it's just almost as if you could just you know, you've got a five or ten year turnaround and you don't care what's happening to the environment around you. It's mm. always a bad investment. Mm. On top of that, the fact is that, you know, we're, we're on fire for the environment, you know, yeah. and we love beautiful places like this and we don't want to see them disappear. Yeah. But if you're talking, talking about an economy, yeah. you have this 
beautiful spots preserved, so it stays this pristine. Mm. The development footprint here is no more than 10%. Mm -hmm. 90% will stay green. Wow. That's how we master planned it. Wow. So. wow. And it's... It's, it's forestry controlled land? It's, it's uh, just down here at Tangent Ring. It, it's, uh, the land here is, is about 95% forestry. Yep. There's one or two little patches of private, sure. yeah, but you have to create that whole package. But yes, yep. it's forestry land. So it's cooperation with the Indonesian government, yep. uh, with the province and the uh, Ministry of Environment and Forestry. And how's that been working with them? Uh, very, very good. I mean, some of the, um, you know, it's, what they want to do is to be able to take care of these of these assets uh, the ministry mm. of environment and forestry owns 67 percent of the land in indonesia wow so they're sitting on some of the most uh, pristine land and then to, to be able to work and, and do a large scale integrated sustainable master plan of the area yes to be able to to make sure that you don't get problems like you're getting bali or or in the gili islands for mm. example you know where development's been ad hoc Yep. And you get one person coming, another person, somebody's doing something great, somebody's doing something not so great. In the end, it becomes so difficult to control. Yep. Whereas if you plan it all together, together with the local people, together with the government, mm. together with a few key actors, bring yep. in the specialists from the beginning, you can create something where you know you're going to maximise the chances of this environment staying in its mm. pristine condition. Yeah. yeah, wow. So tell me, how's a guy from, from Britain end up in Sweden and now here... Right, right down in the tropics on the other side of the world. I mean, what's, give me, this is, this is fascinating. How'd you get here? How, how'd this all happen? Uh, totally by accident. <laughs> <laughs> in both places. <laughs> in uh, yeah, Sweden, I was, um, I used to hang around with a couple of my mates all the time, really, really tight. We, ne we never used to split up, Jim mm -hmm. and Dickie. Yeah. And we decided one year to go down to the Greek islands. Okay. And we were island hopping. It was just before we were going to go to university. And um, we were on the island of Paros. Okay. Uh, sitting in a bar, look, overlooking the port, Beautiful. drinking, and then uh, this this ferry comes in. And sometimes in your life you get this like powerful urge to do something that you normally wouldn't do. I would sure. normally wouldn't separate from Jim and Dicky, but I just thought I had to get on this ferry. Uh -huh. I just got to get on it. And they weren't going anyway. They both had a date each with two German girls. <laughs> I'm going to meet in the in the disco, and I thought, you know, there's no way we're leaving this opportunity. And uh, I just. Got up, got the ticket, and I'm like, sit down, mate, you're drunk, you know. I said, no, I'm getting on that boat. Got on the boat, got upstairs onto the top deck, put down my backpack, turned around. There was the most beautiful, blonde, blue-eyed girl uh -huh. and uh, called Isa. And I, we were together for 13 years, and I moved to Scandinavia. Wow. Of... So that's how you got to Sweden? Yep. And then in Sweden, we did a few things, but there was this, um, they've got what they call Sistian Balaget. Mm -hmm. Right, which is a government controlled, regulated, and they supply mm -hmm. all the alcohol yeah. for Sweden. And of course, they weren't bringing in the, the lager and the cider and the ales that you mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. So, wh what did you do about that? What happened there? Uh, we were sitting in the pub one night. We used to sit in these almost like fake British pubs, drinking <laughs> fake British beer, which, you know, wasn't optimal. And, uh, and we were sitting reading the newspaper, uh, me and a couple of my mates, and it was Sweden announced that they were going to apply to become part of the EU. Uh -huh. and we were sitting there, we just twigged it straight away. We said, well, that means that. You know, they can't maintain this monopoly. You couldn't bring in foreign draft beer. Yeah. Uh, everything had to be brewed, licensed, and it very, very limited what beers that they would bring into the country. Uh, and according to us, not the best. <laughs> so, we, so we had a few more pints and it was like, yeah, let's go off to England this weekend, talk to the Brewers Federation, talk to a load of breweries, and see what we can get into the country. Uh -huh. And uh, we woke up in the morning and I booked the tickets, called up my mates, yep. and they were like, what? What? They couldn't remember what we were discussing the night before. I <laughs> said, <laughs> we're going over to England. So we shot over to England and met some uh, amazing uh, breweries. And um, the last brewery we were going to meet was one called Shepparnim, England's oldest brewery, hmm. uh, from 1697. And uh, we'd seen a few other breweries that we thought we were going to do some business with. And uh, we, we thought, ah, should we bother going down to Shepparnim? They're all the way down in Kent, in South England. But we were in a party in London. Uh, the night before. And when we woke up, we thought, we've still got time to get to, to Shepparnim. So we went on down, and when we got there, they'd just finished designing this most beautiful bottle, and they got the most fantastic old ales. But, and they'd forgotten that we were turning up, so we were unprepared. <laughs> so they gave us, actually, the best price that we'd received for the most beautiful beer. And we were just like, where do we sign? Yeah. So we signed up on it and uh, introduced it into Sweden. There was uh, a lot of stuff that we did to be able to sort of get it into yeah, the system lager. Yeah, but we, we, when we marketed and we kicked it off in Sweden, we, uh, 
it became the second most sold imported beer after Heineken. Wow. And we did that within a space of uh, 10 weeks. Wow. Gee, oh boy. From start to stop. So what, what I get, I mean, and what's really cool about that story is that a few things. One, uh, you know, they said you can't do it. Yeah, well, right. that, that was the whole thing. I mean, we came in with a 50 centilitre bottle. Yeah, yeah. This, is not, this is never going to happen. They said, well, before that, actually, we'd, we'd got in draft beers. Mm. We were told we couldn't bring in draft beers. And we started looking at the legislation, and the legislation said that you could bring in a draft beer if there was a cultural reason for it. Sure. So there was these 10 fake British pubs. So what we did was we turned around and we created a cultural event that was called the Never Ending Party. Perfect. And we just started advertising it and off we were going and we were just selling draft beer, you know, some really good ales. And then what happened was we got a letter from System Blog and Veen and Spreet, there was two monopolies, there was one mm -hmm. for import and then one for sales. Okay. Telling us we couldn't do this and we had to desist and we said sure, so send us a letter signed by your managing directors and we will take it to the EU Monopolies Commission. Yeah. And then they just backed off. So we got mm -hmm. in the draft beer and then we come to them with this beautiful 50 centilitre, fairly expensive Bishop's Finger. And we said to them, you know, we want to bring this into System Blog. And they goes, no way. no way, that's not going to happen. So we had a look at the statistics and uh, basically there was a, a number of British beers that were being sold, one called McEwan's. And it mm -hmm. didn't sell a lot over all their System Blog at shops. And so they said, you have to be able to sell a certain volume to be able to get in. Sure. So we looked at what McEwan's was selling and then we got together our 10 pubs and we said to them, look, the one who sells the most Bishop's Finger under a 10 week period, we will take the whole pub and all of your staff to Britain to the Great British Beer Festival and down to the Shepherd Mean Brewery. Because then you could do it on a private import, no, it wasn't in system blog or something. Sure. And these guys sold, uh, these 10 pubs sold in 10 weeks more than McEwen sold over the whole of the country. And system blog couldn't say no to it according to their monopolies regulation. Wow. And so when we launched it, We'd just taken a whole load of uh, journalists over yep. to, the, uh, to the, the, the Great British Beer Festival. They brewed Bishop's Finger. And whenever they came back, um, we had a barrel of that Bishop's Finger that we put down into all of their bars. Mm -hmm. And then on the day that Bishop's Finger was launched, it was in every newspaper. Mm. Uh, Dogger's New Hater, Svenska Dagblad, Aftonblad, all the newspapers. One title, I think, was... Uh, delicious darkness bring light, brings light to Sweden. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and it just shot straight up there. It's the beginning of a, a bit of a beer revolution in, in Sweden, uh, bringing in all these different ales and ciders. And, yeah. So what that, and what, what that really says is, I mean, if it's impossible, you're up for it, right? If they tell you it can't be done, you're onto it. If you, if you want me to stop and me doing something, that's probably the worst thing to say to me. <laughs> it's just like, what? <laughs> if we want to get you to do something, so this can't be done, it's absolutely impossible, that's and there's it. no way, and yeah. you can't, and you're not allowed. allowed. You're not allowed. Uh, that's it. That's <laughs> then you're onto it. That's it. Yeah. And what I also get is that you, you know, you, you very clearly, you've got a big vision, you've got a big mm. dream, and you can go, wow, I can see this is what's possible. But then you're, you're one, of the, one of the few visionaries who go, actually, you know, here's the steps. And here's how we're going to actually roll this out. And here's the branding, here's the marketing, here's the people, here's the team that we're going to need to build. Here's the, you know, kind of the, the culture that we're going to create. And here's, you know, the process and the strategy. Well, I mean, it behoves you to do it if the vision is beautiful enough. I mean, you have to take all that detail. Yeah. You just keep sight of the vision and then you just, you're just working your way backwards, really. Mm. You know, with all the different, you know, things. So what that's... needed to happen before we got to here? What needed to happen yeah, before yeah, we got yeah, to here? Yeah, okay, yeah. so then we're down to here then. Yeah. This is what we need to do. Yeah, I mean, I was basically trained in it from childhood, really. My mum was from always... From childhood? Yeah, my <laughs> mum was always into, you can do anything that you want to do. She had quite a tough upbringing, and she was this Catholic uh, upbringing and told very much what she could do and what she couldn't do. Yeah. So she was very much, you can do anything you want to do, kids. My dad had a more sort of Derbyshire uh, background. Yeah. It was like you do your education and your dreams could be, trust, uh, could be crushed, you know, so you get a profession, you have that safety. So my mum was always right. going on, you can do your dreams. And my dad was, you know, don't feed them too much of this dream stuff. <laughs> it, could, it could disappoint them. And then my mum, she would never give up. And then yeah. one day my dad just gives in, he capitulates and he goes, okay, they can do the dreams, but I want to know exactly how you're going to do your dreams. So he turns okay. around to me and he points to me, I think it was about six or seven, and he goes, so what's your dream then? Uh, I go, oh, I'd like to build a tree house. He goes, okay, how many nails? Which tree? What pieces of wood? Da -da -da -da. Wow. How are you going to get it there? Da -da -da. Tell me how to do it. But if you're not going to tell me how you can get your dream done, don't bother me with it. You know? Wow. We'll have wow. none of that dream. Unless none it's, of that? Unless it's real. You know. Wow. And you, other, your brothers and sisters? Uh, one sister. Yeah. yeah. 
Wow. So that was the that was how it was at home. Yeah. That's Mom's right. going, follow your dreams, and dad's going, How are you gonna get that done? Yeah. Very practical. It sounds like a beautiful polarity there between yeah. the two of them, right? Yeah. They were a complete yeah. polarity. Often what it takes in great in great partnerships. Yeah. So that got you, I mean, that was, that was the upbringing and that kind of really mm. was a strong sense of, hey, this is mm. who I am and this is what I'm about mm. and this is how I'm the guy who's going to bring my dreams into reality. Mm. And then traveling with your mates, all that happened, got to Sweden. So then you're there, you're running this, you know, you've got this amazing business going on mm. um, and now you're here. Well, well, hang on a minute. <laughs> what, what happened in there? What happened? Well, um... I was, I was bringing all the ales in, the things I loved and the ciders. We were the first people to export, uh, to get, take from England, uh, cask-conditioned, hand-pumped ale since the Second World War. And uh, so we were doing all this stuff. And then a brewery came up to me and said, we've got this alcoholic lemonade. Uh-huh. And the system blog won't, won't let us bring it in. Uh, do you think you could do something with it? And I'm like, it's not my sort of, it's not my kind of beverage. Sure. So I took it up to system blog it, and they said, there's absolutely no way you bring it in. It was <laughs> so that, the was fatal, it. that was the fatal thing. It was like, so how could you bring this in? <laughs> so, so to cut a long story short, I mean, within two months, uh, we got it into the system blog it, and it became the most sold uh, alcohol product, all categories. We were doing 17 40-foot containers a week Whoa. at one point in time, and uh, from zero sales to, with practically no marketing budget. And uh, then I was invited to, to speak at a whole range of different, you know, places, you know, mm. to, to tell about how we'd actually done this. A real form of a quite aggressive guerrilla marketing, but sure. clever at the same yep. time. And then, because it's, I like looking at problems and you know, how, how, do you, mm. how do you solve that. And then I was at, I was at one uh, session where I'd just finished doing a speech and I woke up in the morning in the hotel and it just hit me, bang. I was creating value for something that had no value. Hmm. And I'd sort of come to the end in my mind for this, this beer development thing as well. And um, I had a bit of an epiphany. Yeah. And it just struck, I had a, actually a dream. I had a dream where I was, uh, I was actually, a very powerful dream, I was sitting in the water, I was floating up to here, and my hands down in the water, and everything was blue. Everything was so blue that the hor there was no real horizon. You yeah. couldn't see where the horizon and the sky and wow. the sea, and I was just floating high up like this. And my fingers were there, the sun was out, and I just flicked my finger like that, and this wave went out from me wow. that touched everything. And it, that had a, a profound effect on a few other things that were happening. So I went and had a walk about for a while and came back with an idea of, of going into putting my energies into, into creating value for things that really have value, mm. but maybe are not so connected together. So the first sure. thing I did in Sweden was I started uh, uh, the farmer's market movement okay. in Sweden. Wow. Uh, my dad was super into local food and okay. that was the thing we'd grown up with. And yep. that I'd really taken for granted, you know, mm. all these amazing cheeses and stuff. And loads of local farmers were going out of business. Yep. So I got involved in that and then a whole load of other sustainability projects in Sweden. I was, uh, you know, won a lot of awards there and you know, got fairly well known for the stuff that I was doing. And then one day I felt that Sweden was like, uh, you know, I'd like to expand outside of Sweden. Yeah. I didn't say Sweden's where I'd like to expand. Sweden's doing okay it. now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And also you begin to, to, to come to the limits of what you're doing. Sure. And so I'd like to expand and do something outside of it. So I sort of put it out there, if yeah. you like, in my mind's eye. In my... What did you have in mind? I didn't just that I would like to expand and do something outside. But, okay. but, it, but it was, I've always been fascinated with these platforms. Sure. So it's these platforms, you know, so we, if we have, you know, we travel all over the world, mm. all these beautiful ideas. What happens if we have a platform? Uh, the farmer's market was really a platform mm. you know, and then out of that we created farmers market shops farmers market restaurants and all these different things so the platform expands mm. and you put all these different farmers and actors onto it and then we were doing i did a thing in central stockholm called street where we took all the young designers and we designed a garage into an area that was a restaurant and a market and it could change wow. shape within half an hour to an hour um, so we created it so it was a dynamic space that just kept changing uh, yeah. and so and also we were doing and, and so it's this idea with platforms and I'd been out in Indonesia a while ago, and I'd been here with my daughter mm -hmm. and, and my ex. And we were, um, we found a place on one island that we really, really liked. Uh, she was really small when we were out there, and uh, she didn't like big waves, and this area had a reef outside. It had a mm. few trees and a bit of shade, had a beautiful beach. Beautiful. And there, there, somebody had done a fire there, so I took a little bit of charcoal, and I wrote my name, uh, John and Emma, 
on, on this little stone. This was a place she liked, a small on Stella, as they call oh, it in Swedish. Wow. A little perfect place. Yeah, and, beautiful. And then I left, and then I, I was in the middle of all my projects in, in Sweden. I put yeah. it out there to the universe that I wanted to, you know, do something, you know, else. And then um, this guy contacts me, uh, a guy called Peter. Mm. Uh, Bockhammer. We started this company okay. together and became Peter good Bart friends. Yeah. Wow! Yeah. And then, uh, so he comes to meet me and everything. We became good friends. And he says, "I've got this project out in uh, out in the Gilly Islands, uh -huh. and uh, I want to create an eco village, and I want you to be part of it." And I don't have time. Don't have time. Indonesia, Mr. Busy. Where, where yeah. is that? Yeah. yeah it's, it's Basel. I've been there before, but it's sure. like it's the other side of the world. And then I had uh, all of a sudden I got uh, one of my projects got delayed, so mm -hmm. I had about six weeks. So I said, "Well, I'll come out and have a look." and uh, came out there, had a look at it, and there was only one plot left. Mm -hmm. And it was exactly where me and Emma had written no. our names. Yeah. So I just said, I'll take it. <laughs> like that, you know. So. Well, yeah, I mean, out of 16,000 <laughs> islands in this archipelago. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that becomes, you know, so, and then Peter introduces me to the, the government here in Lombok. Peter's a real fixer. You know, mm -hmm. he knows and connects to everybody. And uh, we, pitched the idea of doing an eco-region. Uh, okay. Here they were looking at how they were going to develop Lombok, and they loved it. Yep. And eventually they offered us this piece of land. Wow. That was in July 2010. And so I called okay. up all the sustainability experts that I knew. I have a, quite a big network. Yep. Asked them if they'd like to come down here and do a master planning and a community planning with the people. Perfect. All 40 said yes. Wow. And I said I'd, I'd take them down here, I wouldn't pay them, but I would uh, get them down here yep. you know, to be able to do a project that's really out there that they wouldn't have to compromise on. And uh, then I called up the Swedish government mm -hmm. and the project had just, uh, it was at the end of the year, so it's usually tight uh, for money. Sure. But another project had just been cancelled, so there was uh -huh. some funds there with CEDA. So I pitched to CEDA okay. uh, in September, got the money in October, uh, well, got an okay in October, got uh, the cash in December, and in January we were down here with Whoa. 40 of the world's top experts to do a community planning with the local people. Wow. So it just, it just took off. I went, um, Seriously fast. And here I am. Wow. Yeah. So that was, yeah, 2010. Yeah. We spent a couple of years really looking at the legislation as to how we were going to handle this because, you know, legislation is, is what's really important. We're setting up special uh, green legislation here. Yep. So what we've looked at is was working together with the forestry, mm -hmm. um, uh, looking at uh, confirmations of the law, asking the government to, to give clarifications on the law because sometimes from our perspective, it's a little bit vague. It can be interpreted in a couple of ways. So strengthening all of those laws up. And then on top of that, we've looked at special economic zone legislation. So this area is going to become a special economic zone. Wow. So it gives it an increased tenure of 80 years renewable. Um, it gives relaxation on the kinds of, com uh, kinds of companies that you can set up. Okay. Uh, it gives uh, uh, freedom on import duties. Oh, wow. So we can bring in the top solar panels. We can bring in really good green tech. Because Indonesia's got crazy, I mean, luxury item tax and import taxes. That's, it's, that's, really really high that's right so if we want to set up the green dream here and yeah. tons of partners are coming to do it yep. you have to be able to bring that in but it's also you know wow. green consumer goods as well i mean what we said to the local government is uh, we should only in this area allow suntan lotion for example that doesn't damage the reef mm, so we'll set up a monopoly of that which we would do together with the local with the local government Perfect. we'd import it when it reaches a certain volume we start to package it here yeah so so building green businesses through creating green that industry. size and that volume and that's again yeah. why the economy of scales matters so much the size of these regions mm. and bringing in a lot of different green partners so you create that demand and mm. indonesia can begin to set up these green businesses so they can be done wow. here. wow <laughs> so we've got, the, we've got the people we've got the space we've got the products mm. what about some of the actual actual developments and some of the you know the, the accommodation and the projects and the different things that that are happening here or that you imagine will be happening here down the track? Yeah, well, I mean, what we do is uh, really the eco regions is an invitation for green people all over the world. But okay. if you're inviting somebody to a party, you have to have a party. <laughs> and you yeah, have to have a few people uh, sort of in the room. So, sure. so that's what we do. We concentrate on a few of the key things. So in every place, what we do first is we do this thing with the local people. So we have the yep. local people are going to be developing and doing certain things. So mm -hmm. we, we zone out those areas. And then on top of that, then we, we always create a place in each of our areas called the Friends Village. And that's, okay. and that's friends of the environment, friends of right livelihood business and personal friends as well. Perfect. And we get that mix of people who come in and do the first eco village. So 
you get then a mix of different house styles and, and different green technologies and things that they're different fans of. Mm. So you create that mix in the beginning instead of just doing something that would be a resort, yep. which, is, which is a bit of a monoculture. Yeah, you know, we're doing sure. it in this design and everything. We create something which is a mix, a Swedish it's a buffet, a smorgasbord sure. of different green intentions and desires, and it really sets the tone that it's limitless, that you, wow. you can try this, you can try this, you can try this. So we set up the Friends Village first. And then what we always do, because we've got so much land and stuff to develop, we set yeah. up uh, glamping, glamorous camping. Oh, wow. So we're gonna have some glamping here on the Pink Beach. Okay. And that means we can move it around to different areas whenever we come in and develop, yeah, nice. you know. So, and then- light footprint. That's right. And then we've, we've partnered up with uh, the development arm of the Karolinska Institute. So we're doing health together with the ecology. Medical research company or institution from <laughs> Sweden. That's right, yeah, they wow. are. They're one of the best in the world. Well, they're the guys who give the Nobel Prize in medicine. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, they are one of the absolutely best in the world. Wow. And they've been doing a lot of uh, uh, cancer research and they've been working a lot with immune therapy okay. and, and different kinds of medicines for that, which you take from the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, you take from the uh, basically from the biodiversity in the environment to okay. so, so create the uh, active substances from it which can affect your immune system and super boost your, you know, wow. your system. So they're coming in and putting in an immune therapy uh, place here. Oh wow. And so they're going to be doing 1,000... So building, building a clinic? Yeah, a clinic uh, with 1,500 beds for rehab Whoa. and stuff. But the, the thing is, and spread out to, into this area, okay. you know, really nicely, so it's not like a huge big, big spaceship concrete. landing on it. Yeah, there. Sure. So, so it's all mixed out. But then one of the side effects of immune therapy, of course, is, is anti-aging because you're super boosting the immune system. Wow. So, so it cures, you know, it, it, it helps all chronic diseases, but then it gives you this more sort of useful, your, your immune system's powering up, it's super boosted. Wow. So onto the edge of that, then we'll be inviting a lot of different actors who are, uh, to do, who are involved in health and wellness. Mm -hmm. So all, everything to do with yoga and, and mm. juicing and mindfulness and all the stuff onto the edge of that as well wow. with the 1000 hectare organic food production yes. on the edge of it and the, the beautiful thing about Karolinska is they've done a lot of studies as well on the effects yeah. of yoga mindfulness organic food on uh, recovery rates from illnesses and they've wow. actually sort of documented that it has this positive effect as well wow. so we'll be integrating this, this basically this super advanced medical uh, immune therapy boosting system together with wellness, together yes. with ecotourism, together with eco farming. Pristine environment. That's right, which yeah. we're protecting through rules and regulations wow. and only developing to 10%. Wow. So who else are you going to board? I mean, that's, that's a major, major partner. Yeah, well, we're, who we're are you talking to. We're, we're just uh, finishing up, uh, about to sign an agreement with Sotheby's uh, Real okay. Estate, which is oh, wow. the, the leading real estate uh, uh, company in the world. So uh, we've been talking to them about uh, in one of the islands in our other place, the, the eight islands, which we're going to have a look at tomorrow. Yep. There, uh, this one tiny island there called the island of Ula. So we're talking about creating a, a James Bond green villa on the Whoa. side of that. Uh, so we're looking at that. And then the Sueco, which we're looking to finalize an agreement oh, with wow. as well. Yeah. They are the big uh, infrastructure and uh, integrated planning uh, group from Sweden. Mm -hmm. They set up a lot of the Swedish developments also and they've done about six eco cities in China. So they'll be coming wow. in helping us with uh, finishing off the planning, the green infrastructures and things yeah. like that. And then we've got a, a whole range of, of different amazing partners coming down, uh, potentially some music partners. There's talk of putting okay. a music studio here. Oh, wow, that would be so cool. Yeah, very, very cool. And then, uh, yeah, a lot, of, uh, a lot of people to do with uh, farming and agriculture. Mm -hmm. But then after that, the, you know, the doors are open. And the idea with Eco Regions is that you can get involved in a variety of ways. You can come here, set up a business. I mean, you need everything here. We need plumbers. We need, you know, um, you know, who, who are doing advanced plumbing. We need architects. We need designers. We need English teachers. We need a whole yeah, range sure. of different things. So come and live you're your building, green dream. You're building a little city here, really, isn't it? You're building a whole... Yeah. Maybe not a city, but yeah. a, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's a region. It's a region. It's regional development. So it's all yeah. those aspects to come and gel together with mm. the Indonesian experts that are here that are involved mm. in it as well. And then the other international experts that we've got. And everybody yeah. can be an expert on their particular area. You're contributing. Yeah. But then on top of that, what you could do is you could recommend people. You could recommend product as well. Mm. What is the best reef safe suntan lotion? What mm. is the greenest toothpaste? What is because all of those things we will be 
taking into the eco region. So mm. the idea is you can contribute in a variety of different ways, or you can just visit here and mm. enjoy the place and contribute to, wow. to growing this green economy. And I have Mike Reynolds this year, of course, with the Earthship yes. fame and yeah, yeah. Already, already building, already creating yeah, yeah. Earthships. That's right, yeah. So he's out on Kanawa. We'll, we'll be uh, talking to him and, and looking at his uh, ship. He's, he's, built, he's building his second so cool. prototype and basically they're getting it down to 20 degrees without having an AC. Wow. And uh, they're building with the local people. So I think he's got about 50 volunteers out there wow. and teaching 10 local people how to do this Earthship Perfect. design. So on that island, we'll be doing uh, that particular design. But the idea is to invite lots of different partners. We're talking mm. to Holchim, which we're going to do, uh, the, the big cement company. Okay. They're, but they're doing prefabricated walls with, uh, with cooling devices in where you pump up the water, put it through a, a system. So the, house, so the house walls cool you know, everything wow. down, which is a really cool innovation. So we're going to go and have a look at that next week. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of guys from Sweden who are doing the, the dome houses. Yes. And then, of course, we work with the local people. So we do the Sasak village, and then up in Sambawa, we're taking the, the, the stilt house design that we've got there, mm -hmm. revamping it up to, uh, up to a tourism standard together with the local people. Mm. And, but the invitation is open, again, to a variety of different people with sustainable designs and ideas to come and, and expand uh, so tell me, tell me about this, because when, when, when you say well, we, we've created this space, mm. we're working with the government, we've got this in the area, we've got these cool people already coming, we're doing some, some really some amazing things, and you're talking about legislation and regulations and, mm. and all this kind of stuff, what's, and maybe even aside from the regulation, personally, what's your <coughs> commitment to, to the environment, to the local, I mean, get your love for the people mm. and the, and the local, local culture, but for these, I mean, these reefs, these, these jungles, the monkeys running around in the trees mm. up here, What's, what's your commitment to really protecting and preserving that for future generations? Please. And how does, the, mm. how does this whole project you know, embody that? Well, it, it, I mean, that, that's, that's total. That's, that's the bottom line in all of this. I mean, ecotourism, you, you can't have it without protecting the environment. Mm. Uh, uh, control and, and regeneration of natural assets is, is one of the major things mm. uh, for creating wealth and, and value and opportunity for local people and for mm. the local government as well. So, so, so we go in and legislate. So what we're basically doing is taking, almost if you like, Scandinavian green legislation and yes. integrating it with Indonesian legislation. Okay. One of the very cool things about that as well, though, it, it creates another aspect, another dimension, is that you've got lots of green funds all over the world. Yes. But a lot of those green funds can't land in certain areas, particularly in Asia, because the investment criteria of the fund doesn't match the regulations yeah, in place. Sure. So we yeah. match the two of them, mm. before we even start. So you can turn a tap on yeah. to green funding into this in whatever way, shape or form it is. But the yeah. bottom line is, is that we're putting up a uh, biopharma. Um, we'll be creating the, uh, the medicines for the immune therapy out of the biodiversity wow. that we're protecting and they're, and they're adding to in the area. And so it's necessity for them as well mm. to be able to to have an intact environment as well. Wow. Anybody who comes here and is co-investing with us in a, in a come partnering with us in a hotel or a restaurant, they want to see that that reef's there. They want to see that these forests are not cut down. Mm. They want to make sure that somebody doesn't cut down a whole load of stuff there and you get erosion onto the reef. Yeah. There's so many things that can mm. damage this pristine environment. Yeah, sure. So that is what we have to legislate. And that is what essentially is creating the wealth for everybody to feed off. It's the protection of the environment. <laughs> Filled my heart with joy. Yeah. So tell me, why is this? Why is this so important right now? Why? Yeah, and if we look globally, even that you know these kind of regions, these kind of projects, these kind of things are having um, that are going ahead. Why? Why does this? Why, why bother? You know, let's just build cities and hotels and McDonald's and uh, you know, mm. big monocrop, mono, monocrop agriculture. And mm. what's what, what do you see as some of the major issues? No, I mean, it, it, that this it, answers. It's just completely and utterly not sustainable. I mean, we're running out. Uh, of land, we're running, we're, we're, we're destroying our environment. And there's a tipping point that we're racing towards. Mm. And so this is why we want to like fast track these large areas. And we want to put them at scale. Mm -hmm. We want to invite a lot of large partners and small partners to be able to populate it, to be able to show that this is an alternative uh, way of doing things. Mm. I'd like this to be the new normal. This wow. to be the sensible way of doing things. Yeah. <laughs> and with, with, the, with the technologies we've got and the knowledge that we've got, we could actually do that today. Mm. But there is no, platform there's no 
place where you can create those economies of scale mm. to be able to do it for a lot. We want to be able to show that you can do it. What I'd like to see is, is some of the most conservative, conventional developers come down here, see what we're doing, and click on to the fact that that reef will still be there in 20, 30 years. Forever. This, this environment will still be here. Mm. And so they don't have this five-year perspective. Think mm. about your assets, think about the bottom line. I would like the so-called smart money, which I don't think smart at all, comes into these areas. If you just look mm. at the development of our houses, Mike Reynolds, he doesn't need an AC. Yeah. What, are, what are the electric costs on an AC? The house gathers its own water. We only have to put in an extra 20%. It captures 80%. What are your water bills? Mm. There's a huge economy in this now, but we have to be able to scale up. Mm. And we have to be able to gather all these amazing people. And once you gather all these amazing people on this platform, what becomes the cross-fertilization? Mm. What comes out of that? Mm. The future comes out of that. Mm. That's what comes, and a better future. Wow. So, yeah. But tell me who, <sighs> far out. I mean, it's just such a, such a cool, such a mind-blowing project and you know, I really I just want to take a moment to really honour you and thank you on behalf of my children for generations to come and, and kids everywhere and, you know, for the, for, for, for humanity. It's, mm -hmm. you know, for taking this responsibility. And I know, you know, it's not been without challenges and you've not, there's been so many difficulties and so many mm -hmm. roadblocks and barriers and challenges mm -hmm. and obstacles that mm -hmm. have presented themselves. And like you say, when, you, when you've got this vision and you go, that's, this is what I'm here to do, then you just get on with it, right? Well, you don't really have a choice, do you? <laughs> when this really? idea's got hold of you, yeah. you think you've had an idea, but really the yeah. idea's got you, right? That's right. Yeah. So what can anybody do? Because a big part of, you know, big part of my message is always for, for, for people back home who are, you know, living in the city, living in the suburbs, or, you know, maybe they've, they've got their business or they're, you know, whatever they're doing. I'm always looking at what's the, what's the simple changes that anybody can make that it's going to have the biggest possible impact. And I think really with this, probably the better question is what how can people get involved what's the specific kind of levels and you know is there different investments is there different there, you know, what's what, what's what's possible for, there's, there's for someone who's just watching this and going this sounds amazing what can i do well there's, there's a whole range of different things i mean for example um we would be contacted by a group of people who were uh football coaches okay and so they said well could we set up a football coach's house here and i got about the place is lovely, the locals love football, can I come down here and teach football? And uh, can we get a deal on a house? And we're just like, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. of course. And then we wow. thought of pitching the same thing to English teachers and to, you know, people who are particularly good with, you know, a lot of the boats here, you know, they're, they're single hulled, mm -hmm. you know, what a nice double hulled boat down here. You know, people who are boat builders, people who are architects. In Friends Village, we're going to do an architect competition in a, I think in about six months or a year's time where we're going to invite people to come with the, uh, the best amateur um, eco house design. Oh, wow. And then they get a plot to put it up. Wow. And so inviting people to come with all these ideas. But if you're not coming to invest or be part of it, come and visit. Yep. Or recommend product to us. Yeah, wow. Or recommend people to us. Yep. Because it's all about populating this. When we mm. first started off this project, we, the, the, the project name was really the gathering of the tribes. Wow. And it's the gathering of the green tribes, if you like. Yeah. But from everybody right up, you know, you've got this powerful Karolinska Institute tribe. You've got this very, you know, sort of old venerable tribe that's been going for years, which is the Earthship tribe, yeah. which are landing here and coming with their fantastic ideas. And yeah. we've got, you know, the next and the next and the next and the next and the next. Mm. And when they gather together, and they create that critical mass, build a green economy, simply by being here and doing their businesses. Mm. And our job is really to, to hold that space for mm. them to be able to do that. You know, Mike said to me, he goes, he goes, I don't envy you, John, you've got the shittiest job in the world. <laughs> he goes, I love doing earth ships, but you're yeah, gonna take his thing. all the problems off my table so I can just do wow. earth ships. And that's what we want to basically say to people, that's what we're doing. And then filling the space with lots of people that anybody who's into green sustainability, right livelihood business, mm. the kind of people that you'd like to associate with, the kind of people you'd like to do business with. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Wow. So for, I mean, for Mike Reynolds, he's saying it's, you've got the worst job in the world because what he loves is building earthships. 
So you've taken all the legislation, all the all the bureaucracy and all those difficulties with, with locals and the, mm. the, all the different levels of challenges that you've been up against mm. and basically paved the way for everybody else to come in and go, well, this is the project I'd like to bring to the world. And it's always been too expensive back home and too risky or too, mm. you know, all the different reasons why we couldn't do it in a place like Indonesia. And you've gone, we've got all that handled. Mm. We've got the taxation handled. We've got the legislation handled. We've got Company all the different levels of everything. government. Yeah. Come and do it. Just yeah. come and do it. Yeah. Oh my God! Wow! 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 <laughs> John, it's such a credit to you, and and I really, you know, so much I admire about you. But certainly your commitment and persistence with this, like you're just not letting go. And you know, now we're starting to see it all come to fruition. It's just such a beautiful. Yeah. Well, we we got our construction thing. offices in down there. We're just about to book our tents. Yes. Um, our glamping tents. Uh, Mike's building out in uh, in Kanawha. That's Kanawa. with Annika, right? Yeah, with, with Annika. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's well, beautiful. Just oh, recently. Beautiful. Fantastic. Kit that she creates. So you're going to have all those set up here? Yeah, uh, Annika's going to come down in about three weeks, we were talking about. Yeah. Uh, we've got a group of people coming down. I think we've got Sasha Stone coming down. Um, oh, fantastic. We've got a, a member of the Qatar Royal Family's coming down. We've got uh, Sotheby's are coming down. We've got um, uh, the, the chairman from the, the Karolinska uh, group is coming down as well. Okay. So we, we've got a group of us. We'll be uh, shooting up and down places, making plans and yeah. Wow. It's, uh, it's, it's the gathering of the tribes. The, uh... Fantastic. <laughs> wow. So, I'm so grateful for all mm. that you're doing and for this time that we've been able to share together and for taking the time to really tell this story. And, and you know, it's, it's such a big project. It was initially hard for me to kind of wrap my head around what's even going on here. Mm. Um, and just, you know, fabulous. So, thank you. Thank you. And my pleasure. Mm. And any, any final thoughts, any final, anything else before we wrap up? I think that... Um, the thing is, is that we have to do things at scale now mm. and we have to and it has to be integrated. We can, we can no longer, I mean, it's great to have people in the world doing all of these small projects, but we need larger platforms to do it. Mm. Green needs to become the new normal, mm. you know, and there was a friend of mine I was talking to in Sweden. He was saying, I really want to change the planet. I really want to do things. But what are my options? I can buy some, some uh, organic produce and I can sort my rubbish. Well, yeah. well, what else am I going to do? Some eco-friendly appliances or some energy efficient. And yeah. yeah, that's it. And he goes, I want to do so much more. And I think sure. that's the dream. And so what we're basically saying is we're here to help facilitate your green dreams. So wow. Anybody with any ideas or any, you know. This who, is the place to come. Them. Yeah come to us so, and, and then also if there's like-minded people around the world as well we're hooking up with with loads of different people now who've got different projects in different places we are very very happy to share as well what we're doing as well yeah, so there, wow. are, there are technologies nice. coming to us ideas coming to us and so it's not just a thing that should stay here in Tangen Ringit Tangen yes. Ringit and the eight islands should be a, a springboard to something else mm. and so I would say that it's, it's, it's all very much possible but wow. if we're going to do it uh, we have to now, all these great sort of uh, ideas and uh, products and people, they need to come together mm. and create something bigger because we're racing towards a tipping point. Sure. So we have to scale up. So let's, let's tip the right direction. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fantastic. Well, I'm really looking forward to connecting with people who are watching this mm. and having conversation with them about their green dream mm. and then being able to introduce them to you and your team and, and, mm. and bring that in. That's, yeah. that's super exciting. Yeah. Thanks again, John. Magic. Fantastic. Yeah. All right, there we go. Some of these <laughs> We've got this is a map of the of the region. Mm. We've got you know, Bali's kind of over here. That's right. Yeah. Lombok and Sumbawa. Yep. So tell me, step me through what's what are, we, what are we actually looking at here? Well, we're concentrating on the Alice Straits here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the forgotten jewel, if you like, of, of NTB of this area. And, wow. and our, our first region is down here. This is 350 hectares. Uh, 10 bays and beaches down at Tan Tanjung Ringgit. This is where we have the pink beach as well. It's only 55 kilometers from the, uh, from the airport here. Mm -hmm. We generally bring people down here to Tolong along and then bring them by fast boat. So this, bit, this last bit's only 10 minutes here. Gotcha. Uh, we've got a 1,000 hectare area and a sort of agroforestry area that we're working together with the local people on to do permaculture and organic farming. Mm -hmm. And this really opens up the whole of the, of the Alice Straits. I mean, it's only 15 minutes down here to, to a whole load of uh, surf beaches. You've got Jalanga Beach. Uh, just around the corner here to Kuta and to Grupuk. So all of this is the surfing area. 
There's lots, you get a lot of big fish around here as well for diving and stuff. Uh, we do a fast boat going up to the Eight Islands. The Eight Islands is our second area. Mm -hmm. And here you've got, um, about, we've got 20,000 hectares here. And most of it's marine. And we've got about 1,000 hectares of land. So it's eight paradise islands and a wow. peninsula coming out here. So all of these are sitting on like a little forest of coral. And this is a particular protected bay. It's protected by these areas, you know, this long island coming out here as well. Yep. So this is a really secluded bay. We'll be putting a marina in here as well. And it's right by the Sail Indonesia route here as well, with connections to the Gili Islands and to Moyo. And uh, wow. next month, they're opening up a, a fast boat service with a 200-person fast boat. It's the ones that go from Singapore uh, to Batam. Uh -huh. uh, so this, uh, the whole of this is now going to be opening up wow. and happening.